One world currency. The new world order. Those are the roots of trouble. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hmm? Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life. That there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. This is your last chance. After this, there is no turning back. You take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Well, we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. But I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. And now, welcome to another episode of Down the Rabbit Hole. Here's your host from federaljack.com. It's Popeye. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another live edition. It is November 21st, 2000. And 12 is the day before the 49th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. And today I'm going to be going over a bunch of different things for you. Some stuff I, I, you may have heard me talk about in the past, maybe uh, you know stuff from like a year or two ago. Uh, but this is not stuff that is talked about in the regular uh, circles, you know, they're with the conspiracy. There's, uh, I guess, different circles of information, and the further you go, the deeper, uh, more detailed, more uh, sometimes even weirder information you find. Uh, the average person that knows about the assassination doesn't know many of the things that I'm going to air tonight. So, since I have a lot of new listeners, and since there are a lot of people that do have questions. I'm going to air a few interesting things. I have some uh, audio clips and I want to be I want to go over a few interesting things for you in that regard. Uh tomorrow, before I forget, I want to advertise this. Tomorrow from 12 p.m. to 12 a.m., so from noon to midnight, uh Jimmy uh has been kind enough to the listeners. Uh, he's going to give everybody like a, a I guess like a Thanksgiving treat. We're going to have Commercial free, except for the top of the hour. Uh, you know, going in and out of the the, the hours there, you'll have a, a few minutes for for news and stuff, and some uh, promos and whatever commercials. But during the each hour, things are going to be commercial free, and you're going to hear uh, audio. The what we're doing is the first nine hours from noon to nine, we're going to air the audio from the men who killed Kennedy. It's a series that the History Channel put together. Has a lot of good information in it, uh, especially the last three pieces. History Channel says there's only six, but there's actually nine. I've talked about it before. One of them was when Judith was interviewed. So tomorrow, uh, and they don't play them anymore, by the way. They used to air them, and they don't even air the, the first six anymore. It's like they you don't see them anymore. It's something they, they don't even want to talk about. So uh, we're going to air the audio from the Men Who Killed Kennedy series uninterrupted. You're going to hear the first six pieces. And then you're going to hear the three missing pieces, parts seven, eight, and nine. And there's going to be some other uh, con- uh, JFK conspiracy assassination oriented things up until midnight. So make sure you tune in. Special JFK 49th anniversary uh, special tomorrow from noon to midnight here in Orion. You're going to get to tune in and you'll hear the audio from. 
the men who killed Kennedy series and a few other things. So check it out. Special thing. Big thanks to Jimmy X for doing that. Uh, I hope the listeners appreciate it. It is pretty cool. So, uh, you know, commercial free, no, you know, you're going to hear the full audio. So that's pretty awesome. And it, it takes a lot of work for him to do that. So big kudos to Jimmy. All right, I want to get into it. I have a bunch of different audio clips I want to play for you. A few things I want to go over about the JFK assassination that you may not know about. Uh, one thing we're going to cover tonight is the amount of deaths that occurred. I don't know if people realize, but the amount of deaths that occurred around the assassination, not just JFK himself, but people involved with the assassination. Now, you could say, well, that would mean by definition that there's a conspiracy, Popeye. Bingo! It's exactly what I'm saying. See, by def- by definition, they want you to believe that only Oswald did it and acted alone because then there is no conspiracy. Because remember, the definition of conspiracy, see, nowadays people don't think about this really too much. I mean, they still go by the same playbook. But back then, they understood that the term conspiracy wasn't as taboo as it is now. And that if the term conspiracy came up, that would mean by definition that m- more than one person was involved in this. And they couldn't have that. So... And even to this day, they have to stick to that because if it was, if you had more than one person, again, if it was more than Oswald, right? If it was, even if Jack Ruby helped Oswald, if anybody even helped Oswald, see, that was the key thing. They didn't find that there wasn't, they, they didn't find that there was a conspiracy involving, uh, you know, like Ruby and this person and that person and, and so and so and so and so to kill Kennedy. No, no, no. They found it was only Oswald. They can, it, they can never, it doesn't matter how he's got connections to all these people, the government has to say it's, it's circumstantial or it doesn't matter or it's not important or this or that or it's top secret. They have to say that. The people that pulled it off have to say that. Because if by definition anybody even helped him clean his gun, it's a conspiracy. If somebody said, yeah, I'll help you, you know, I'll clean the gun for you, make sure everything's prepared for you, you know, I got your back, you know, President Kennedy needs to go down. By definition, that's a conspiracy. It's two or more people getting together to do something bad, i.e. a plot. That's actually what it says when you look it up in the dictionary. So you can't have any evidence out there that says that Oswald did not act alone. Uh, And that if you do, it has to get squashed. That's how they they roll. Now, interesting, over 80% of the country here in the United States believes that there was a conspiracy and that the government is lying. 80%. You'd think they would just eventually let it out, right? Well, they're going to ride this one out, it looks like, until they have no choice, but the truth comes out. And the truth is coming out. And that's why they keep pushing back the dates of uh, the classif- de- declassification of the Kennedy records. I mean, that stuff was supposed to be declassified. Actually, I believe it was supposed to be declassified either this year or next year. Because that next year is the fiftieth anniversary, and uh, Obama pushed it. I think he made it indefinite that they won't declassify it. I'm not saying that oh, you know, he's behind it. I'm just saying I mean, each president has always uh, pushed it back whenever it came up, and uh, they kept pushing it back and pushing it back. And I think uh, when it came up when he was the president, he may uh, since he's been president, he uh, he pushed it back indefinitely, if I remember correctly. But it was supposed to come due. Uh, within the in, within the past few years, all the the classified documents dealing with the the assassination. And that's assuming that they haven't burned, shredded, or uh, you know memory hold whatever's in there. And I'm I'm sure that there is a file somewhere with all the information, but it's probably in the same warehouse that you know at the end of Indiana Jones when you see them putting the Ark of the Covenant away in this vast government warehouse. It's probably buried in there somewhere. I doubt they have it. At the ready right now. I mean, that was 50 years ago. Since then, they've had other uh, just as bad, just as big uh, conspiracies, plots, whatever. So tonight, I'm going to go over a few different things for you, and I'm going to play a bunch of different audio. You're going to hear, get to hear from the deceased Colonel Fletcher Prouty about uh, JFK, and I can tell you that there is no one that I trust more when it comes to his opinion about uh, the assassination, what he has to say about it. Uh, there are different people, you know, some people, their views on Prouty differ here or there or whatever, but I'll, uh, I have nothing disparaging to say about the man. And when it comes to the JFK assassination, I think he's on point, and I have no reason to distrust him because I've read his books and I've researched what he said. I've seen the videos and I've researched it, and 
I mean, the, the guy's on point. He was Kennedy's chief, uh, chief of special ops. He was the first chief of special ops. And if you've never read his books, and if you don't know who Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty is, get a pen, get a pencil, write his name down. Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty. I'm sure you can just look up Fletcher Prouty. But Colonel L. Fletcher Prouty. He's got two books, JFK and The Seeker Team. JFK, and then it's got like a subtitle, and then the other one's called The Seeker Team. Go get both those books and read them. All right, we're going to break. When we come back, I'm going to get into the audio clips for you and start dropping some JFK assassination knowledge. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. I noticed uh, in the chat there was uh, a question about the History Channel doing a quote-unquote truth series. Yes, I know it's hard to believe. Uh, it was actually not done by the History Channel per se. It was done by, um, and I don't know if they do this anymore, they might have actually nixed this, but uh, it was done by um, an independent contractor, which is, I know a lot of times, <clears throat> some of these networks, uh, they'll hire like outside production companies to put together something for them or whatever. In this case, it was a guy who actually was a researcher. His name was Nigel Turner, and he was a filmmaker. And... Uh, he put together the first six pieces uh, back in the 90s, and I think it ended, the last one he did was somewhere around like 2000, and then he came out with, uh, in, uh, around 2003 with the, the last three pieces, which was uh, The Smoking Guns, um, The Love Affair, which involves Judith Baker, who I've interviewed multiple times, and if you want, you can go just go to the archive section on Federal Jack. Uh, click on the archive page and scroll through, and you'll see my interviews with uh, Judith Baker about uh, cancer as a bioweapon, Lee Oswald, you know, the JFK assassination, a bunch of stuff. So she was in part eight, and then part nine is the guilty men. <clears throat> uh, and that's actually, that shows the involvement that LBJ Johnson had in the assassination. And that doesn't mean I think that Johnson. Uh, conspired to kill Kennedy and that he was the only one let me rephrase that he was part of it but he wasn't the head of it he wasn't the guy that sat up and said let's kill Kennedy I'm sure it was brought to him and said hey you know we could kill him and yeah you know I know you don't you know you, you you're not afraid of murder you've done this before you know you've had to you know I'm, I know you're not afraid to get your hands dirty you know this is how you'll benefit and I'm sure Johnson said, well, I can get my guys to help. And, you know, you, you, something this big like taking out the president, you would need it to be a big operation. There would have to be multiple levels. And the reason for the multiple deaths afterward would be to clean up the mess. And that happens a lot. I mean, go watch the movie Goodfellas. You know, after, after they, 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 they're worried about getting caught, what happens? All the guys that were involved, right, they all start ended up the one guy, they find him hanging from a meat hook. Uh, in an ice truck, everybody got everybody gets taken out, right? Well, it's the same thing. After the Kennedy assassination, everybody that was involved, I can guarantee you, within five years, anybody, assassins, anyone that was involved, heavily planning, uh, if they didn't have some sort of, uh, uh, if they didn't have some sort, you know, if they weren't super high up the food chain, and even then, a lot of them bit the dust. It's the list is it, it, not just witnesses. If you look strange deaths surrounding it. Witnesses, witness deaths by itself is is astounding. You start to look at the deaths that uh, of uh, people that were just surrounding it, not even just witnesses, but it's astounding. It really is. So, okay, I want to get into Fletcher Prouty. I have about enough time to play the this first clip of uh, Fletcher, and he's he's talking. To, I want to. It'll introduce him a, a little bit. You'll get the idea of uh, why he's important. Um, he was mentioned in the, in the JFK movie. He was the Mr. X character. And he'll mention that briefly, but he talks about the CIA. This, this clip I want to play for you is important because he explains that the, how the CIA works. And he, he, he expl you'll hear him. I mean, let, me, let me let you hear it from his mouth instead of mine. Here you go. I think that people need to understand, and I certainly talked to Oliver about this quite a bit, and it's what he liked about the film, I mean, doing the film. The Central Intelligence Agency is an agency. That's an important word. They work for people that come to them and say, do this, just as if you had an agent in your work, you would say, do this. When you begin to understand that, you understand why they do many of the things they do. They don't sit there and think about doing it themselves. They do it because 
Usually the White House, the National Security Council said, do this. And that's very important when you're trying to understand CIA. When Oliver and I first talked, I went through that several times to show him examples of that sort of thing. And therefore, if the mafia comes into the scene or some of foreign troops, foreign people, foreign governments, it usually is as part of what they've been told to do. It isn't something that, um, you know, they plan to do or do regularly, that sort of thing. It takes a bit of an understanding of the CIA to really know how they're working. Now, the CIA is, is, is well known, but is it true that, you know, could you describe a little bit that uh, of how there's an intelligence community that has more than just the CIA, there's military intelligence, the Defense Department, that, that talk a little bit about what the what the intelligence community is like on a, on a broader scale, if you will. One of the failures in World War II, according to President Roosevelt and President Truman, was the apparent inability of the various intelligence organizations to work together. So the president would get a briefing from the Navy or the briefing from the Army or from the Treasury Department where there is intelligence and so on. And he'd often wonder, you know, is, is, is this the same intelligence? Is this the same country? Are we working together? So when the war was over, he disestablished the OSS immediately. One of the first things he did was stop OSS. It was mostly covert operation anyway, not so much intelligence. And then Congress passed a law, the National Security Act of 1947, that created the Central Intelligence Agency. But that law says that the CIA was established <clears throat> to coordinate intelligence, not to collect it, you know, not, not anything, to coordinate, that's all, because the intelligence is in the government in many different areas. <clears throat> and very few people seem to have noticed that. It's right there in the law, been in the law since 1947. So just as you say, there is Army intelligence, Navy intelligence, Air Force intelligence, the Treasury Department intelligence, of course, FBI, it's got to be considered. There's agricultural intelligence. And the CIA puts people in departments. We used to put people in the FAA because we know all about what, Airplanes are flying, what's going on? So we have intelligence people in the FAA and so on. It's a big community. It's even in the industrial community. As you've read in the papers, uh, newsmen are used, college professors are used. Intelligence is a big business. But CIA is supposed to coordinate it. That's their role. Uh, it doesn't always work that way, but that's the way it's supposed to work. Now, they're pro CIA is prescribed from operating within the United States. Yes, that is by law. There are cases where because of the number of Could foreign people say the CIA is not allowed to, you know. Yes, the CIA is not, and this is by law, uh, allowed to work within the United States. It has no police authority uh, like uh, the KGB in, in the Soviet Union was. And as a result, it is a foreign intelligence organization but it still coordinates the intelligence of organizations that may work within the United States in order to make sure that it all comes together somewhere, like NSA, which most of us don't know very much about, but it's listening to communications all over the world, and it has to be integrated somewhere. So it's, it's, it's a big network, and CIA is at, at the point of it. Now, in the JFK, in, in JFK, were you the Mr. X that was portrayed by Donald Sutherland? Yes, and... Um, Did you start against like, I was the Mr. Um, I, I was Mr. X, or I am Mr. X, as portrayed by Donald Sutherland, because when the script was written, and before I saw it, that part was there. And when Oliver asked me to be an advisor to the film, not a writer, but an advisor, he gave me the script, and I began to read it, and I saw this man X... But I found my own words from things I had written years before were there. And then I found a man was working in the Pentagon. And I found a man went to the South Pole. And I found a, he bought that newspaper in New Zealand. And now, wait a minute. I recognize Mr. X. So I had a little talk with Oliver. He said, well, it's a composite a little bit. He said, but we had to put a character there. And he said, you're it. So I was delighted that Donald Sutherland played the part, by the way, because uh, I think he did a good job. All right, we have a break coming up. So that's Fletcher Prouty a little bit. Now you have an introduction, <clears throat> and you heard him 
discuss the CIA. When we come back, I want you to hear what he has to say about the tramps. The famous photograph of the tramps in Dealey Plaza the day of the assassination. You might find it interesting. We'll be right back. I got sidetracked before I didn't finish my thought when I was explaining the uh, History Channel series, so I'll get this out really quick, and then I want to play this uh, clip from Fletcher Prouty uh, talking about the tramps and Dealey Plaza and the JFK assassination. But um, the reason why uh, <clears throat> it's I, I want to play not only the first six, I mean, because a lot of the information is valid. Some of it is uh, you can make your own choice, but when you research it, but the last three were censored, seven, eight, and nine. And those were the, the ones I was talking about. They were censored. Uh, there, I think it was back in like 2003, between Bill Clinton, Lady Bird Johnson, uh, some other groups, and uh, uh, even Bush himself, President Bush, you know, his family and stuff. Uh, they put pressure on the History Channel to uh, not air them again. They think they only aired once, not air them again, and then remove them and not even admit that they exist and they they don't the history channel if you go to their their store uh and you try to look at the dvds the men who killed kennedy it says it's a six-part series if you go to netflix it says it's the same thing it's not it's a lie it's a nine-part series so you're going to hear those so that's uh, i got sidetracked and i wanted to make sure i covered that really quick so all right i want to play this audio of colonel fletcher proud to check this out this is him being interviewed on uh, uh i think it was black ops radio which i'm going to get uh a cynic on my show. I'm working on getting him on as a guest. Uh, so here, check it out. I thought you all would enjoy this. This will get a little bit uh, the mental juices flowing. Colonel Fletcher Prouty discusses Dealey Plaza, November 22nd, 1963. Colonel Prouty worked in the U.S. military for 23 years, nine years in the Pentagon from 1955 to 1963. He worked closely with many influential people, including Director of Central Intelligence, Alan Dulles, General Victor Krulak, and General Edward Lansdale. Colonel Prouty's work centered on special operations, the support of clandestine activities. While in the office of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, he worked with the Office of Cover and Deception. He established and was the first head of the focal point office between the Air Force and the CIA, the Chief of Team B. Here are observations he made in 1989 regarding photographs taken in Dealey Plaza. The photographic evidence as a total at that time is absolutely amazing. What various researchers have done is take all these photographs and place them in a time frame so that you can see where people standing in one place and there's the same person over here and other ones and begin to identify some of these people. So we've worked very hard on looking carefully at who is in these pictures. There are several of them that are really outstanding and one of the most amazing is this group of these three men who the news story said had been removed from a boxcar in a rail yard right in back of Dealey Plaza and were being led from that boxcar by police to the sheriff's office and that's the end of it. The trail ends. They weren't booked. There's no record of them at all. Well, let's look at the pictures. The pictures do show three men that somebody have called tramps. Well, they got new shoes on. They are not tramps. And the police that are leading them, one in front and one in back, one of them has very clearly a hearing device in his ear. And furthermore, the Dallas police don't lead prisoners into the sheriff's office. The police and the sheriff's office work together, but their jobs are entirely different. And in a sense, taking prisoners to the sheriff's office is the last place the police would take any prisoners. So all that part of it is very questionable. So when researchers had arrived at that point, one of them came to me one day and said, look, of all the pictures we've studied, this little episode of these men being marched right across the in front of the school book depository building where Oswald was supposed to have been and across the street by Dilly Plaza where the president's car had just gone into the sheriff's office. There's something wrong about these pictures. So we looked at them very carefully. And in the very first picture, in addition to the two policemen and the three tramps, as they're called, is another man. And he's walking in the other direction. But the thing about it is, 
so that his back is more or less to the, or his side and his back is more or less to the photographer rather than face forward. There's something about it is how is it possible that anyone at Dealey Plaza that day, and here these men are probably being marched across there five minutes after the president was killed. Everybody was running around, people were excited, sirens were blowing, and here's this man in a business suit, just as casually walking along. He doesn't even turn, he's not looking at anybody, just walking past, and he happens to be standing by these men as they're being marched. The least he would be doing is looking at these prisoners or looking at the policemen, you know, anybody would, especially at that time. This man's looking at nobody. And I recognized immediately that that man is General Lansdale. Now, Lansdale is a very interesting figure in the Kennedy era. And I know Lansdale, I've worked with him off and on from about 1952 to, to uh, well, 1963. So he retired, this is interesting. He retired from the Air Force on October 31st, 1963. Well, of course, the picture could have been a hundred other people, and I could be wrong, but I know him very well. Then I looked at the tramps themselves, and there's this strange little eye catch between this man and the first tramp coming by. In other words, the first tramp, instead of being seriously concerned about the fact that he may be charged with the murder of the president, is smiling. And the second tramp has a sort of a quizzical little look and you can tell that he has looked at this man walking by and he has the same kind of approach you know as though he's just been reassured everything's all right the third man happens to be in back from the camera's point of view and you don't see him at all but that little bit of expression is saying an awful lot at that moment the police themselves have expressions that indicate more that as if they were saying to somebody say boss am i doing all right you know that kind of thing in other words was lansdale walking down right in front of the school book depository building to sort of reassure some people here maybe his employees or somebody that's working for him what's the significance of that well of course that happened to be my own interpretation the men who had brought the pictures to me hadn't the slightest idea who it was and I decided at that moment that what was needed next was a lot of research. So I got some very clear copies of those professional pictures. These pictures were taken by a professional news cameraman. I got a clear picture. And I started mailing the picture to acquaintances of mine and acquaintances of Lansdale who knew him without any of my thoughts. I simply would send the picture and say, can you tell me what this looks like to you. This was taken shortly after the death of the president, and uh, I wonder if this picture calls anything to mind to you. You'd be amazed to find that from senior people in the government, such as Lansdale was, or such as I was at the time, I got immediate confirmation. That said, Lansdale. Well, now, I don't know why he was in Dallas. I can't go into that. But it's astounding that this man, who was Assistant Secretary of Defense for Special Operations after General Graves Erskine retired, who uh, was the man who had more or less almost single-handedly set up Diem as President of South Vietnam, who again almost single-handedly had set up President Magsaysay as President of the Philippines, who was considered probably the most significant person in the U.S. military, U.S. government on the subject of counterinsurgency, civic action, special forces, Green Beret troops. He had written the, he had written the, the, the books uh, that the Green Berets used in their courses down at Fort Bragg. What could have been his role at that time? I had a very personal interest in that because only uh, a month or two before that, Lansdale had met me in the halls of the Pentagon and said that he had arranged for me to go as a escort, military escort officer with a VIP party to the South Pole. And it happened that I left for the South Pole on about November 10th or something like that, and that I was in New Zealand on the way back from the South Pole when I heard about President Kennedy being killed. Why Lansdale asked me to go to the South Pole, I have no idea. Or was there some connection between this role that he may have been playing in Dallas and the fact that he would just as soon I be out of town 
and I reflected on that, especially when I begin to read. I'm going to pause it right there because we got a break coming up, but I'll pick it up. There's probably about uh, two minutes, two and a half minutes left, something about like that. So I'll rewind it a few seconds and let you hear it. And if you don't know what he's talking about right now with him getting sent out of the country, go watch uh, Oliver Stone's JFK. Watch the, uh, the part with the Mr. X character and you'll see what he's talking about. And just actually go read Prouty's books. That'd be even better. We'll be right back. Only uh, a month or two before that, Lansdale had met me in the halls of the Pentagon and said that he had arranged for me to go as a escort, military escort officer with a VIP party to the South Pole. And it happened that I left for the South Pole on about November 10th or something like that, and that I was in New Zealand on the way back from the South Pole when I heard about President Kennedy being killed. Why? Lansdale asked me to go to the South Pole. I have no idea. Or was there some connection between this role that he may have been playing in Dallas and the fact that he would just as soon I be out of town? And I reflected on that, especially when I began to realize that almost all of Kennedy's cabinet was out of town, that some 45 officials with the cabinet were also out of town in Honolulu and on their way to Tokyo. They were actually on their way to Tokyo when the president was killed. And over the years, I have made a study of how many people central to the inner workings of the secret government of this country had been moved out of washington at that time it's a very very interesting subject i wish i could answer it i don't know how to answer it i'm sure the picture is lansdale others are sure it's lansdale and i have to leave it there Colonel fletcher prouty and general victor krulak both worked with general edward lansdale in the pentagon both men identify him being in Dealey Plaza, November 22nd, 1963. General Lansdale specialized in political, psychological warfare operations and manipulation of governments. He worked for Alan Dulles, the director of Central Intelligence. Although his cover story title was Air Force Colonel and later General, he was always working for the CIA. The photo of him reveals deep involvement with certain members of the CIA in the planning, removal, cover story, and cover-up of the assassination of President Kennedy in Dallas on November 22, 1963. Planning and cover story for such manipulation of government personnel was Lansdale's forte. Documents shown here are available at www.prouty.org. And I left that in there so you guys could hear. That's www.prouty.org that's the website for Fletcher Prouty go check him out, buy his two books, read them check out more of the interviews he's done I promise you this man knows what he's talking about and when he says that there was a conspiracy and that there was more to it you should listen to him and he points out pretty much uh, what you know the and this is good, he died back in I think it was 2000 and I think it was 2001. I think it was the summer of 2001 he passed away. So uh, it would have been interesting to get his take on 9-11 and what he thinks with all the information coming out now. There's one more piece of audio from Colonel Prouty that I would like to play for everybody, and it's, uh, it's only about two minutes. He discusses the lack of protection for Kennedy via the Secret Service in Dallas on the, the morning of the assassination. Listen. What they call protection of the president is an old skill. I went to Mexico City in 1956 when President Eisenhower went to Mexico City. And by that I mean the security people went there more than a month early to look at every angle of the trip. There are rules and manuals on what we call protection. The Secret Service, that is an organization of limited size, is authorized to call any number of military people. And these are military people who are already trained to augment their forces in a case like this. There's no shortage of people. Ordinarily, a unit of military, I think was called a special group number 113, would have come up from San Antonio, Texas, and would have been deployed all through the streets of Dallas, the important streets of Dallas. That was not done. In fact, the commander was specifically told he wasn't needed. You've all seen the picture of the school book building, you know, where Oswald is supposed to have shot the president. You notice in those pictures there are open windows. If the Secret Service had been there, 
and had done their usual job, none of those windows would have been open. And had anyone opened one of those windows at that time, they would have been on the radio, they would have had a man in that room immediately, and the window would have been closed. You see, that's protection. That didn't take place. In fact, there were no Secret Service people on the ground around Dealey Plaza that afternoon. They were told they were not needed. Instead of going straight down the street and then to the trademark, he made this 90-degree turn and then another very sharp turn in front of the school book depository building. Now, the Secret Service have rules against that. The rules are that if the car is slowed down below 44 miles an hour, you must then protect it fully in other ways, such as not digressing and going around corners and all that, because when you slowed him around that corner, you opened up field of fire from three directions, behind him, to the side, and from in front, and of course he was killed right in that position that had been set up by the selection of that route. And if you go look, uh, you look into who was the, the mayor of Dallas, he's related to one of the generals that was fired. In fact, if I remember correctly, it was his brother. Uh, if I remember correctly, yes, it was his brother who was the mayor of Dallas, and they they were the ones that were in the mayor of Dallas and the Secret Service were the ones I believe that were in charge of the motorcade route, which got changed at the last minute uh, into that weird turn, which slowed him down. Uh, it was guaranteed to keep him uh, the car uh, within a certain mileage, and then the only thing the driver had to do was slow down, which he actually did when Kennedy was shot and the shots rang out. Instead of putting his foot to the floor and taking off like you're trained to, he did not do that. He actually slowed down and hesitated for a few, for a couple seconds, and then took off, which that opened up Kennedy to, you know, slowing down and almost coming to a, a, almost a complete dead stop. Just that, that's it, done. It's like shooting fish in a barrel over and that's what happened boom 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 and you see the headshot to the forehead of course the government will have you believe that what you see you know as kevin costner said in the movie jfk back into the left the government will actually have you believe that the bullet came from behind and passed from behind through the back of his head and came out his forehead and that explosion you see on his forehead is uh it, you know when when the bullet hits him in the head and, and the explosion you see in the back I should say that is the bullet passing through his the back of his head and the it's the gas that was behind the bullet that was trapped inside of his head pushing out that made that explosion that's their excuse that is their excuse Anybody that's ever shot anything, a watermelon, a target, knows that when you shoot, usually the hole going in isn't that big. The hole on the other side, though, is rather large. Kennedy had a huge head wound. In fact, hour two, I'm going to play some audio for you, which I, I played once before, but I had to cut it off uh, a little bit early. So I'm going to try to squeeze it in if I can at the, at the end, but I might not have time for it. If I don't, and you can check it out, oh, I'll give you the title now just in case I forget to because sometimes I get so slammed. But I have it on Federal Jack uh, titled, it's under the, uh, if you just type in JFK, that's one of the tags. It's one of the things that comes up. But the title is What Happened to JFK's Brain? And I've played some of the audio before, but I'm going to play it again. I'm also going to play, um, it was, that was with one of the corpsmen, uh, the, the audio from What Happened to JFK's Brain. But I'm going to actually play an interview with one of the doctors uh, that you're going to hear him talk about when he went in there and he saw Kennedy's body and, you know, he witnessed this, he witnessed that. You're, uh, you're going to get a chance to hear who he is uh, and give you a little bit of uh, information about him, but then you'll actually get to hear in his own words what he saw. Now, uh, th there, there's a lot of shady things that went on with the death in, in the hospital. Johnson calling the hospital uh, with um, Oswald when Oswald was shot. Same type of stuff. There was a lot of shadiness going on there. So it, there's there's enough evidence to point to the fact that there obviously was a conspiracy, right? Now it's just a matter of what angle do you want to try to approach it from because it is such a vast thing. So there's different and there's there's so much different information when it when you look at the Kennedy assassination and there's a lot of disinformation out there too. There's a lot of garbage that's out there. A lot of stuff that's put out there to you know the stuff where. Uh, they say the driver shot Kennedy in the head. That's not true. He didn't turn around and shoot him in the head. There's a lot of people that believe that. I know for a while um, Cooper believed it. But you know what? Let's be honest. Bill Cooper's been dead for a while now. It's unfortunate 
because I, it would be great if Cooper were still around. I would love to be able to pick Bill's brain and, you know, what do you think's going on now with all this? He was a smart man. But he also admitted that he had been duped at times here and there. So I don't think that... Uh, I don't think that the the driver turned around and shot him in the head. There's I, I've seen the evidence. It's just not. It's garbage. It, it really is. I don't think he stopped and turned around and shot him in the head. Sorry, I, I you know they're, they're, and again I don't want to hear that Cooper thought it because that's like the strongest evidence that people bring up. And Bill Cooper's been dead like eleven years. I'm willing to bet that over a course of eleven years, his thoughts, maybe his, you know, given new evidence and shown new stuff, his thoughts might have changed. He admitted that when he talked about the UFO stuff, that it could have been twisted and turned, and he could have been led down a path, you know, of disinfo to get him away from what was really going on, which is what he can then talked about this government conspiracy, right? Well, what if it was the same thing? What if he got too close to the JFK thing? And to certain realities, like there was a Secret Service stand down. Not only did you hear Prouty talk about it, but just Google Secret Service stand down on YouTube or go on Google and look it up and, and click for videos. And you'll see <clears throat> as the limo turns on the Elm Street, you see the guys that were, would have been in the back, would have been in the way of the first couple shots on Kennedy, right? Yeah. Those guys, they get waved off the last minute and they give it the, the what the F, you know, hands in the air. But they do what they're told because they're they just following orders. And then within the next 15 seconds, their boss's head is... So, that was a conspiracy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to break. We'll be back in a few minutes. Hour one up, hour two coming up. Don't go anywhere. Who's Rose Sheremy? Stay tuned to find out. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back with hour number two here on tonight's live edition of Down the Rabbit Hole. I am your host, Popeye from FederalJack.com. It is November 21st, 2012, one day before Thanksgiving 2012, and one day before the 49th anniversary of the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Tonight, I have been playing some interesting audio from you, coming from, so far, Colonel Fletcher Prouty, and now I have a bunch of other stuff I want to jam in here into the second hour. One of the things you're going to hear uh, is a guy from a guy named Penn Jones Jr. He's now dead. He is a, a old-school uh, Texas journalist, and he's been on the the Kennedy. He was on the case of the Kennedy assassination since the twenty second of November, nineteen sixty three. So, I'm gonna you're gonna get I'm gonna play some uh, audio, so you're gonna get a chance to hear uh, what he had to say about the strange the strange deaths of witnesses and stuff uh, that were involved uh, in the Kennedy assassination, which I talked about earlier. But first, I want to answer the question that I asked going into break: Who is Rose Sheremy. Who is Rose Sheremy? Well, why don't we find out who Rose Sheremy is? They're gonna kill Kennedy. Through the credit sequence of Oliver Stone's JFK, we get in segments the story of a woman who's thrown out of a car, abandoned, ends up in a hospital, and warns the people in attendance that President Kennedy is about to be killed in Dallas. She says that these are serious men and somebody has to do something. What not very many viewers realize is that this story was absolutely true. And it was investigated by Jim Garrison, the House Select Committee on Assassinations. And now the review board has released more documents on this remarkable story of this woman who three days in advance predicted that President Kennedy would be killed in Dallas. On November the 20th, 1963, Louise Guillory, a hospital director at Musa General Hospital called State Trooper Francis Fruget, who worked in narcotics detail. She told him that they had a patient at the hospital who was under the influence. Fruget went over and found a woman named Rose Sheremy in the waiting room outside the emergency room. Musa was a private hospital, so Fruget had to arrange to have her transferred and also to receive a sedative. On the way to the state hospital at Jackson, Louisiana, Rose Sheremy began to relate her remarkable story. She was en route from Florida to Dallas as part of a drug deal with two other men who were Cubans. Rose Sheremy was to function as a courier of funds for heroin, which was to be dropped off to her by a seaman coming into the port of Galveston. From there, the three were to proceed to Mexico. At a seedy bar en route called the Silver Slipper Lounge, an argument ensued, and Rose was roughly abandoned by her friends who threw her out. Then while hitching a ride, she was hit by a car 
driven by a man named Frank Odom. Odom had delivered her to Musa Hospital, where she was picked up by Frugé. While on the way to Jackson, Rose told Frugé that in Dallas, the men had planned to kill Kennedy. According to several witnesses at the hospital, on November the 22nd, Rose again predicted the assassination before it happened. She also told the doctor there that she knew that both Ruby and Oswald had known each other and she had seen them together at Ruby's club. Frugé later also confirmed that she had worked for Jack Ruby. Another employee at the hospital, an intern named Wayne Owen, told his local newspaper in Wisconsin that he and other interns were told of the plot in advance of the assassination. He said that they even heard that one of the men involved was Jack Rubenstein, which was Jack Ruby's real name. Rose also told of that association with Ruby to Dr. Victor Weiss at Jackson Hospital. After the assassination, Fruget told the House Select Committee that he demanded to see Rose Jeremy again to interview her. She told him that her two companions actually seemed to be part of the conspiracy rather than just aware of it. Fruget then had her story about the drug deal checked out by both local and federal authorities. Fruget then had his superior, Colonel Morgan, call up Captain Wilfritz of the Dallas Police to offer Rose as a witness to his investigation. Morgan told Fruget after the call that Fritz was not interested. So, a potentially explosive witness was now turned away in 1963. In 1967, Jim Garrison received several leads about Rose Sheremy from people related to the Jackson Hospital, which is about three hours north of New Orleans. This included a friend of Dr. Victor Weiss, a man named A.H. Magruder. Garrison tracked down Fruget, deputized him, and then asked him to find Sheremy. Fruget found out that she had died in a car accident in 1965. Fruget told the House Select Committee in the next decade that he then found the Silver Slipper Lounge, where Rose had become separated from her two friends in 1963. He found the bartender in attendance the night Rose had walked in. The man's name was Mac Manuel. Fruget displayed the manual, several photos of suspects from the Garrison investigation. Manuel picked out the two men he had seen with Rose Jeremy that night. This is significant because, as we now know, both Cubans were at Guy Bannister's office in New Orleans, and they both knew David Ferry and Clay Shaw. So now, according to this verified Jeremy story, we have a connection between New Orleans and Texas just days prior to the murder of President Kennedy. And there's a lot of connections between New Orleans and Texas, and there's also a lot of connections between Miami. You know, they, one of the, there was, uh, I believe it was three spots that they had that they were planning on whacking him in. One of them was in Miami. It just didn't work out the, the way they thought it was going to work out. And um, actually, Judith, uh, if, when I interviewed her, she's talked about this multiple times, and she even talk, talk, talked about this in her book, that Lee Oswald had told her that uh, he was able to foil uh, an attempt on his life. And when she had put two and two together, uh, she figures that around the time frame of when they would have tried to take him out in Miami. So uh, that's interesting. If you don't know who Judith Barry Baker is, you can check her out. I'll be interviewing her live coming up soon, again, within the next week or so, because she's doing a uh, a book tour here in the States. So I'll be actually interviewing her live instead of doing it all cloak and dagger style like, nor like uh, I'm kind of used to with her. But she was the mistress of Lee Harvey Oswald. She's got a book called Me and Lee. Uh, you can go check it out, meandlee.com. Uh, she is. Uh, I, I've I've checked her out. I've researched her, and uh, to for from my standpoint, from my angle, she stands up, uh, and you know her story stands up. And there's a lot of other people that have researched her. So check her out. Her name's Judith Barry Baker. You can actually go on federaljack.com. I've interviewed her three times. Uh, one time it was like six and a half hours. Just go on federaljack.com and just type in her name, and uh, it'll come up. Or you can look in my archives, and uh, it's all there in my archives too. So I want to get into the rest of this other audio because I'm very time limited because I have a ton of stuff I want to play for you. So I'm going to start this interview. Uh, it's about a 10 minute interview. I'll have to stop it for the break uh, in, a, in a few minutes and uh, pick it up. But actually, let me double check because I might not even have enough time here. Uh, mm, you know what? I'll wait. I'll start it on the in the next segment because it's about ten minutes long, so we really won't even get that far into it until the the break starts. You only get about a minute into it, but it's gonna. I'll play coming back in. I'll do this for time's sake. Coming back in from the next break. When we come back in, I'm not even gonna talk. 
I'm just going to start the, the interview. And it's with Dr. Charles Crenshaw. And he was at Parkland Hospital. He was a Parkland Hospital doctor. He was a doctor at Parkland Hospital. And he, he, you're going to hear him talk about, remember I said that they, the official government story is that he got shot in the back of the noodle. He didn't get hit in the front, even though, you know, back and to the left, back and to the left. Grassy knoll, gunshot from the grassy knoll. Everybody says, oh, that's crap. I have a, uh, a, a snippet to play for you from a guy named Lee Bowers to shoot that down. But uh, And he's one of the witnesses who mysteriously died in an in interesting manner. Who you'll, you'll hear how that happened, too. But I want you to hear what Dr. Charles Crenshaw has to say. He was a surgeon at Parkland. And I'm sure, I don't even know if, I don't know if Dr. Crenshaw is still alive to this day. He, he could be. Uh, he might not, though, because the interview goes back a while. But you'll hear him being interviewed, and they ask him, you know, the story, they're saying the government, whoever is the, the official story, is saying he was shot in the back of the head. And you're saying that he wasn't. You're saying that the wound came through the front. And he says, yes. It's pretty powerful. I mean, this guy's a, this is, you know, this isn't some quote unquote kooky conspiracy theorist in his mom's basement. This is a surgeon. Parkland Hospital. This is a guy that worked on Kennedy when he went into the hospital. So, again, coming out from the break, coming back in, or, yeah, coming back in from the break, rather, I'm going to uh, play. I'm going to pick up with the interview with Dr. Charles Crenshaw. So stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back in three minutes. Doctor, the president we know was shot, passing on the road in his motorcade down below, and the official version has Lee Harvey Oswald firing from behind. From what you say and what you're describing, he was shot from the front. That's correct. Meaning there had to be two gunmen. At least one and maybe two more. And you believe that? I'll always believe that because of the wounds that I observed at Parkland Hospital. Most important. Today, Dr. Charles Crenshaw is chairman of the surgery department at John Peter Smith Hospital in Fort Worth. But in the early 1960s, he was a third year resident at Parkland Hospital in Dallas, assigned to the trauma team where he had observed hundreds of gunshot wounds. Let's recall the scene that day. A bewildered First Lady, her clothing splattered with her husband's blood, stayed by his side as he entered the hospital. Among the surgical staff rushing into this medical chaos was Dr. Crenshaw, a junior member of the emergency room team who became an eyewitness to history. We ran into the emergency room and there was bedlam, total bedlam. People were running in, uh, people were crying. Did President Kennedy have uh, any vital signs when you reached the... He had barely a pulse. He had an agonal respiration. He had no blood pressure whatsoever. Did you see the tide, his life, in effect, running out? Yes. However, God love him, Malcolm Perry, he didn't want him to die as much as all of us. He started closed chest massage, pumping on his chest, trying to make him come back or resuscitate the heart. After the medical team had done their best, had worked as hard as they could and realized it was hopeless, was there time for tears among those who had put so much emotion and effort into this? Just before the cleanup really started, there was blood and bandages on the floor. His back brace was askewed on the wall. I think it got to me most when I looked and saw the red roses of Mrs. Kennedy in the kick bucket there at the head of the table. And there his blood was still dripping on it. I was, felt helpless. I wished we could have done more. I mean, here we had trained all our lives and we'd lost the President of the United States and nobody wanted to be around. And Mrs. Kennedy came in, and she stopped and kissed his great toe. And then she went on the right side to hold his hand. And at that time, she took her ring off and put it on his small finger. And then he was wrapped in a sheet, and we placed him in a coffin. But before we did, I looked at the wound again. I wanted to know and remember this the rest of my life. And the rest of my life, I will always know he was shot from the front. 
This bullet to the head was beyond a doubt the fatal wound, which is clearly seen in the Zapruder home movie. However, the film is not as conclusive on the crucial issue of the bullet's direction. Did the shot come from behind Kennedy or from the front? Remember, the Warren Commission investigation concluded the shots came only from behind. Dr. Crenshaw says they're wrong. The bullet struck about where and passed about where? From here right. through. And taking out the... The back or the occipital part. The back of your head. This was gone. Uh, in our view, and we, that's the reason we could see the cerebellum. Had the bullet come from the back, uh, what would have been the difference? It would the have been much different. It would have gone a little more anterior and be a bigger blaster. Right. The second wound? The second wound was here in the throat, right above the necktie. It was a small opening, very small, three to five millimeters, about the size of your little finger. In a slow motion study of the film, President Kennedy grabs his throat with both hands, reacting, Crenshaw believes, as if he is shot from the front. Compounding the mystery is this photograph of the government's autopsy, showing a gaping wound in the president's neck. A tracheostomy incision was done at Parkland over the site of the bullet wound. Crenshaw says someone tampered with that wound after he last saw Kennedy's body making it larger to resemble a bullet exit wound. Look, this is the size of the tracheostomy tube. Mm -hmm. Incision was made and then placed in. This large part, this flange, stays outside. So it was a small wound about the size of the, the instrument uh, that they Right. An inch to an inch and a half maximum. This wound and described in the Warren Commission was almost three inches wide. Double the size. Double. Is it possible that the doctor uh, working to put this in what may have been already a bullet wound uh, made the incision too large? Oh, no. No, Perry was an artist with the blade. Hmm. He was one of the best trained technical surgeons. But it seems almost incomprehensible that a team of highly intelligent, highly trained doctors could be standing over the President of the United States and see wounds that you say came from the front, and yet the official government story is it came from the back, and wait this long to break the silence. Intimidation, fear, and career-mindedness. Those are the factors. Exactly. But again, you have to understand the time in 1963 the people that were with this country were telling you what to do, how to do it, and I think uh, the feeling was we went along to get along. Now semi-retired, Dr. Crenshaw has written a book breaking nearly 30 years of silence. Could the, what you call a conspiracy of silence have been out of plain old-fashioned patriotism among the doctors? No question about that. And Dr. Baxter had wanted no one to say anything because he was worried about commercialization. Well, I made the statement that any one of us uh, in the school or in the hospital that ever made a dime off of anything they said about the assassination, I would try to see that their medical career was ruined. You felt that strongly? Yes. I don't know how many emotions were in that statement, but I felt like it was uh, one that needed to be said. That's the reason I waited so long. I waited until I felt I'm at the end of my career. I don't fear my peers, because I think they believe it too. This is the basement floor. He has been shot. Oswald has been shot. Lee Oswald. Dr. Crenshaw's role in history was not over. Just two days later, another victim of the madness that gripped Dallas was wheeled through this hospital emergency entrance. Lee Harvey Oswald, the accused presidential assassin, was shot. And though mortally wounded, he too was brought here. Inside, there was another urgent rush of medics to the trauma room. Among them, again, the young Dr. Crenshaw. As the team was around him at the table, working, trying to save his life, you were called away. What was that about? The nurse came and tapped me on the shoulder and asked if I would take the phone call. And I picked up the phone, and it was like thunder like God was talking. He said, this is the president, Lyndon B. Johnson. I said, yes, sir. And he said, how is the accused assassin doing? 
I said, well, he's critical, but right now he is holding his own. He then said, I want you to take a message to the operating surgeon and have a deathbed statement from Oswald. Oswald died on the table without saying a word. Could LBJ have made the call? The answer is yes. 2020 has obtained copies of White House logs from November 24th, 1963. LBJ was in Washington attending church when Oswald was shot at 1221 Eastern Time. And at 12.45 p.m., the same time Oswald was in surgery in Dallas, LBJ was first told he had been shot by Secretary of State Dean Rusk. I'm going to pause it right there because we've got a break coming up. Coming back in on the other side, right from the break, I'm going to pick it up with the remaining audio from this. I'm going to get into a few other audio clips, including Penn Jones Jr. Do not go anywhere. LBJ have made the call? The answer is yes. 2020 has obtained copies of White House logs from November 24th, 1963. LBJ was in Washington attending church when Oswald was shot at 1221 Eastern Time. And at 12.45 p.m., the same time Oswald was in surgery in Dallas, LBJ was first told he had been shot by Secretary of State Dean Rusk. Moments later, LBJ, according to historian William Manchester, said to Robert Kennedy, quote, We've got to do something. We've got to get involved. President Johnson then had 15 minutes to make a call to Dallas before going outside to be with Mrs. Jacqueline Kennedy for the procession to the rotunda, where the late President Kennedy would be lying in state. However, there is no official record of this phone call. What could it all mean? If LBJ were on the line to Dr. Crenshaw demanding a deathbed confession, it means the new president was moving quickly to wrap up the case along government lines. How much of that was in the Warren Commission information? None. None at uh, all? I never um, talked to the Warren Commission. Uh, no one knew ever that uh, Lyndon Johnson called Parkland. Today at the School Book Depository Museum, among the exhibits, is a display of a few sketches of the Kennedy autopsy, along with the official explanation that the wounds were from bullets fired only from the rear. What was your reaction when you saw the results, uh, photographs and the sketches from Bethesda, the autopsy down there? Uh, it, was, it was beyond disbelief for me. I could not believe that a real pathologist would put out something this poorly. Was this the same man you saw as far as uh, John Kennedy, the same body that you observed? Not from the pictures that I saw. And I put him in the coffin. So you say their report, in effect, is a fraud? I say that it's uh, wrongly done. And the way it was done, maybe they were directed to do it that way. And now, Penn Jones Jr. on the strange death surrounding the JFK assassination. And forgive the audio, but this was shot a very long time ago. Penn Jones Jr. is long dead. So, here we go. We are at the office of Penn Jones Jr. in Midlothian, Texas, 25 miles from the Dallas courthouse. For the past two years, he alone in the Dallas area has conducted an independent investigation into the assassination of President Kennedy. Well, I love President Kennedy very much. I was one of the few weekly newspapers that covered the Ruby trial. And my actual investigating did not begin until I started reading the Warren report and realized that something was very, very much amiss in reading that report. I really believe that the only way you can believe the Warren report is to not read it. Have you found it difficult to uncover the facts this time? Yes, it's very difficult. Witnesses are reluctant. Some of them have gone into hiding, or at least cannot be found by me. And many, in many cases, the police have actually told, or in some case, some witnesses say, federal authorities have told them not to talk about the assassination. Uh, the witnesses are frightened. Uh, some of them uh, went into hiding. I'm, I'm sure that I spent at least one month searching for Earlene Roberts. And I don't know of any person, any newsman, or any investigator uh, 
that talked to Earlene Roberts after she testified before the Warren Commission. And her testimony was quite startling. Now, of course, she is dead. And she's not the only one. There are at least eight persons now dead, either from murder or at least strange deaths, who were closely related to Jack Ruby or Lee Harvey Oswald. Can you give us one, one instance uh, of a witness uh, who died a strange death? Well, let's take the case of Betty Mooney McDonald one of Jack Ruby's strippers. A fellow named Warren Reynolds saw a man running from the scene of the Tippett slaying. Shortly thereafter, Reynolds was shot through the head. Now, before Reynolds was shot, he could not identify the man running from the scene as Oswald. Then he was shot through the head, and a fellow named Garner was arrested. Then McDonald was the alibi for Garner. She said Garner could not have shot Reynolds because he was with me at the time. Two days after her alibi, Mooney, Betty Mooney McDonald was arrested for fighting with a roommate. Although the roommate was not arrested, McDonald was put in jail that night, and an hour later she was found hanged in her cell. And, of course, the Dallas police said she hung herself. Did Reynolds finally testify before the commission? After Reynolds recovered from his wound, he testified and was able to identify Oswald. That's one of the uh, examples, and there, there are many others. Bill Hunter was shot through the heart in the police station out in uh, Long Beach, California. Uh... Cody, M. Cody on the Times Herald was killed by a karate chop to the throat uh, in his apartment in Dallas. And the man that uh, was the most likely uh, suspect was not even indicted for the murder. The death of, uh, of uh, Tom Howard is a very strange one. He said he died of an apparent heart attack. There was no autopsy. But I know personally that Tom Howder, Howard was acting very strangely three days before he died. Uh, I and other people who saw him felt like that he was very frightened. Three days later, he was dead. Now, he was the man who saw Jack Ruby first after the killing of Oswald. Well, whether these deaths are related to the assassination or not, uh, does the fact that witnesses have died in this fashion uh, tend to make it more difficult to secure statements from those witnesses who have survived? Certainly, there is very little evidence, uh, first-hand evidence left uh, with the erasing of the lives of uh, Tippett and Oswald and and these other people who, who were, had first-hand conversations with either Ruby or Oswald, that has made the gathering of evidence very difficult. And the continued threats uh, on these people who still have evidence uh, makes, it, makes them hesitant to talk and makes anyone trying to do investigative work very, very difficult. I would love to see a computer... Uh, faced with the problem of coming up with the probabilities in the, of the assassination taking place the way it did, with all of these strange incidents that took place before and are continuing to take place after the assassination. I think all of us who love our, this country should be alerted that something is wrong in the land. That's a lot of deaths, ladies and gentlemen. That's a lot of dead people. Now, you can go look up the video if you want. I urge you to so you can see uh, the list and you can see some of the photos and stuff. But it's titled Strange Deaths, but, uh, or quote, uh, Strange Deaths, quote. But I urge you to go look up 
just go read. Go look up the Kennedy assassination. Start to read stuff by Fletcher Prouty. Uh, read Jim Mars's book, Crossfire. That's like a, a, that's going to take you a while. That's a big book. Um, uh, let's see what else is out there. Uh, James uh, James Douglas, uh, JFK, um, and I forget the exact title. Just look up James Douglas. He's got a book on JFK, uh, and you, you'll want to get it. It's an excellent book. There's a bunch of good books out there. Uh, like I said, me and Lee, uh, look into just look at just. If you're not sure, if it's too much, if you know reading all that information is too much, I get it. Uh, I know how it is. Uh, start off with you can go on. There's a couple good uh, documentaries. <clears throat> if you want, go to uh, federaljack.com. Go to the Truth Movie section. I have a JFK assassination section there. You can start with some of those, and that'll ease you into it. And then you can start to read some of these books. But I promise you, everything you've heard tonight is factual and true. We'll bring it back. We are back, ladies and gentlemen. Make sure you tune in for the special broadcast tomorrow from noon to midnight here on the Orion Talk Radio Network uh, covering the JFK assassination. We're going to be playing a bunch of different audio for you. I urge you to tune in, especially um, between uh, 7 and 10. Especially between 7 and 10, because that's when the three memory hold episodes of the men who killed Kennedy will be in, uh, be airing 7, 8, and 9 and that would be the Smoking Guns The Love Affair and The Guilty Men alright well I only have enough time to play one section of audio and I have a bunch of stuff left for you so I want you guys to go check out because I have talked about it with Judith before The Death of George DeMorenshield and um, I'll, I'll upload it to Federal Jack Tube, and I'll throw it up on uh, Federal Jack the, on the website and up on Facebook and everything. So what I am going to play for you is what I did promise I was going to play earlier, uh, which is uh, an audio clip about the death of Lee Bowers. Now, Lee is anybody that's looked into uh, the JFK assassination knows Lee Bowers is, is a big key witness because he actually had uh, a aerial advantage. He was in uh, he worked for the railroad or he worked for a company that was by the railroad. You'll hear it in here, but he was a, he was by the railroad tracks uh, behind the grassy knoll, and he was where he was from his vantage point. He could look down onto like the grassy knoll from the opposite side, from like behind it, where you'd see the people that were shooting standing, and he saw people there shooting. So, and this is this is an old clip. Uh, it's interesting to take note that it's, I forget what show it was, but Geraldo was the host of the show, and you'll hear him talk at the, the, the end because he, he kind of poo-poos all this evidence at the end. But the evidence that comes out is accurate about Lee Bowers, and that's what's important. So I want to play this for you. Final segment, here we go. JFK eyewitness, Lee, or JFK assassination eyewitness, Lee Bowers and his strange death. Lots of witnesses around Dealey Plaza that day. One was in a unique position to see what was going on behind the wooden fence atop the grassy knoll. When questioned, railroad supervisor Lee Bowers gave the Warren Commission intriguing testimony. But did Lee Bowers die before he told the complete story of what he saw? He was in the tower behind the wooden fence, the only person back there who had the right to be there who wasn't planning to kill the president so far as we know. This is an aerial view of Dealey Plaza. The president's limousine was here when the fatal shot was fired. This is the Texas School Book Depository, where Lee Oswald worked. And this is the stockade fence and the grassy knoll. It is here that assassination witnesses and researchers have long believed at least one gunman was hidden. The gunman who fired the shot that killed the president. Where were you employed on November 22nd, 1963? At that time, I was employed as a tower operator for the Union Terminal Company. At 12.30 p.m. on November 22nd, Lee Bowers was here in this railroad tower. From this window, he could see the motorcade's progress on Elm Street, and he had an unobstructed view of the wooden fence atop the grassy knoll. After the assassination, Bowers tried to tell the Warren Commission what he saw that day, but like many other witnesses, he was cut off. However, in this 1966 interview with Mark Lane, he was able to finish part of what he had begun to say years earlier. And with some unusual occurrence, a flash of light or smoke or, or something, uh, which uh, caused me to um, 
feel like something out of the ordinary had occurred there. On a railroad overpass adjacent to the grassy knoll stood a number of train workers whose testimony confirmed Bauer's observations. Well, uh, we all three seen or four seen about the same thing at the time. I didn't know what it was, but it sounded like a loud firecracker or a gunshot. And it sounded like it came from the left and in front of us towards the wooden fence. And there was a puff of smoke that came underneath the trees. Is there any doubt in your mind that that shot came from behind? The There's no doubt in my mind. The Warren Commission concluded that Lee Harvey Oswald fired three shots at the president, all originating from the sixth floor of the Texas School Book Depository. But Robert Broden, co-author of the bestseller High Treason, and photographic consultant to the House Assassinations Committee is one of many who disagree. We have the ear witnesses. We have the medical evidence. It's all consistent. Every bit of evidence in every field shows that at least two shots came from the right front, from the area of the stockade fence. Four months after this interview was filmed, Lee Bowers died or was killed in broad daylight on this remote Texas highway. Lee Bowers was heading west here on... Highway 67, heading from Midlothian down to Cleburne. And according to an eyewitness, he was driven off the road by a black car, drove him into this bridge abutment. He didn't die immediately. He held on for four hours. And during that time, he was talking to the ambulance people and told them that he felt he had been drugged when he stopped for coffee back there a few miles in Midlothian. But why would Lee Bowers have been killed when it seemed that he had already told all he knew? Walter Rochelle was a friend of Lee's and of his late brother, Monty. Rochelle says Lee Bowers was afraid to tell all he witnessed during the assassination. Rochelle told the explosive story to now investigative reporter Maury Terry in an exclusive interview in Dealey Plaza. He said he saw a car pull up. Two men get out of the car. And they were carrying what appeared to be rifles. He said that one gunman apparently positioned himself either on their car or on a car. The other one, I don't recall where he said he was. He said he saw both men fire shots. He could tell by the smoke, the puffs of smoke that came from the rifles. You're saying that Lee Bowers told you that he saw both men fire? Yes, he did. Bowers also told his minister that he had seen more than he told publicly. In addition, legendary Texas journalist Ken Jones Jr., one of the first to challenge the official version of the assassination, says he also heard the complete Bowers story. He is the man who said he saw gunmen firing at the president from, uh, from their hidden positions. He didn't see all of them, but he saw two of them that were firing at the president. Later, another witness who wasn't questioned by the Warren Commission, a deaf mute named Ed Hoffman, said he too observed two men behind the fence and saw at least one shot fired. Further, acoustics tests conducted by the House Assassinations Committee determined that at least one shot was almost certainly fired from the knoll. So why was Bowers so afraid to tell the full story? Walter Rochelle provides a possible answer. Lee had disappeared for about two days, one night I know for sure, which is very uncharacteristic of him. And when he came back, one of the, uh, his fingers was missing on one of his hands. So Lee gave Monty some excuse for what had happened, which Monty didn't accept, so he called the local hospitals, the uh, clinics, and uh, some doctor's offices, and there was no record of anyone, uh, and certainly not Lee, going in and having that taken care of. And shortly after this alleged disappearance and mysterious maiming, Lee Bowers died in that suspicious automobile wreck. At the time I was in Monty's office, he was quite upset because the insurance company had refused to pay the claim. I can't recall too vividly, but I believe that Monty felt that the insurance company did not believe that his death was accidental. If Lee Bauer's death was not accidental, what was it? Joining me now, Craig Rivera. What was it? We don't really know because the death certificate is missing. Hmm. What about the official autopsy? There is no autopsy either. So if he didn't die by accident, did somebody kill this guy? It could very well be. And uh, there's also some more evidence that backs up what Lee Bowers told Walter Rochelle. You mean about the gunman from the grassy knoll? That's right. Three railroad workers who also saw a puff of smoke and heard what they thought were gunshots ran down to the area, the wooden fence behind the grassy knoll, and they found cigarette butts on the ground, footprints in the mud, and also mud on the bumper of a car. 
and that indicates that uh, somebody could have stood up on that car overlooking the uh, grassy knoll. That fence overlooking the knoll. All right. Okay, thanks, Frank. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. I want to thank you all for tuning in tonight. It is, we have what, maybe about three and a half minutes before midnight. It's going to be the 49th anniversary of the death of President Kennedy. I hope that uh, the audio I've played has sparked an interest in those who have not researched this. And I hope it sparks uh, this urge to go research it for yourselves. There's a lot of documentaries on YouTube you can watch as a start. Uh, there's a lot of disinfo out there, too, but um, uh, there's a lot of good stuff. Uh, there's good books. I've, I threw out the, the names of some of the books before. Uh, again, if you if you want an easy start, just go to federaljack.com to the Truth Movie section, and uh, I have a JFK assassination section. You can start there and then you know use that as a stepping stone. At least get your basics there, and you can use it as a stepping stone. But as you can see... It was definitely a conspiracy. Oswald did not act alone. I mean, please. All the evidence and all the mysterious deaths. That's why I played... I mean, there's. this is just the tip of the iceberg, by the way, for those of, have, of you that have never researched it. That's why I, a lot of the stuff you heard talked about tonight, some of it will be uh, covered tomorrow when uh, we play the, uh, the... We do the JFK special 12 to 12. So tune in from... Just put it on in the background. You can put it on tune in on your phone, whatever, on your computer. Remember, tune in works on your home systems too, so you can just put it on in the background and let it play, you know, while you're walking around the house or whatever. But uh, 12 to 12, noon to midnight, special JFK uh, broadcast here at Orion Talk Radio. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so very much. Uh, I, I, I want to say happy Thanksgiving, but I'm torn because I understand the reality of the situation behind it. So I guess happy Thanksgiving, but also uh, to the natives that were here before us, uh, I apologize. Uh, sorry about what happened to you. I, I really do. That's not sarcastic either. I, it's horrible. Ladies and gentlemen, you should look that up too. That's a separate show. All right, I'm out of time. I love you all. I'll catch you all again on Friday. Peace.